This is my colleague Hi. Christina. We are both software developers and consultants working for Concentric in Germany, but that's more than enough about us. What I'd like to know is who of you has ever thought of building something in 3D, but maybe for a reason or another didn't? And yes, that's quite a few. Uh, about one and a half years ago, Christina and I were at that same spot, and today we want to show you how to get started actually doing that, and for that we use Babylon.js, first we are going to talk a little bit about what Babylon.js actually is and how it works, and then we are going to build a small world step by step, and at the very end of it, are going to show a live demo. Fingers crossed for that. So, first, what's Babylon.js? Let me go on the website of Babylon.js. This is what we see. Babylon.js describes itself as a complete JavaScript framework for building 3D games and experiences with HTML5, WebGL, Web and Web Audio, or as I'd like to say, it's a 3D game engine that runs in your browser, which is very neat. Babylon.js is an open source JavaScript framework that has been around since 2013, and at the end of the month, they are going to release a new major version, version four. And so now, let's get right into it. How does it work? We have three basic thing, things that we need to think about. The first is the engine. The engine is like a happy little painter uh, that needs a canvas. And uh, of course, it needs something to paint. And in Babylon.js, that is called a theme that can be whatever you want. And uh, today, this will be a house. And uh, this happy little painter is a very, very fast little dude. He paints the scene 60 times every second onto the canvas. And uh, since it's running in the browser, so we, of course, need some sort of uh, canvas inside an HTML document. And the important thing is we give it an ID, Babylon Canvas. And uh, so let's get started with actual JavaScript. The first thing we do is uh, we create an init game function. And inside of this function, the first thing we do is uh, we actually grab our canvas by the ID we assigned previously. We are going to initialize our engine and our scene. And to get everything running, we tell it to, hey, loop around and uh, please render our scene. The last thing, of course, is uh, we start everything. So let's go on from there and actually start building. But we still can control the scene. We do not know where we're looking at the scene, what we are going to do with the scene, how we change the position of the scene. That's done actually by camera. But at first, let me explain you something about uh, Babylon.js. Babylon.js is written in TypeScript, so everything is a class, and most classes are following the same pattern for the constructor. It always starts with a name. You can give it somehow some name, and then you're going to put the options inside. If it's just one value, it would be already the value, but if you have more than this, you're going to use the option object. And then you must say, hey, it belongs to this skin. Actually, when you have only one skin, you do not need to do that, but if you have multiple skin, you must say, hey, it belongs to this skin. So that's the standard pattern which you always see during our complete talk. So back to the cameras. So how do we going to find which part of the scheme we are going to see and how we can control the scheme? It's done by cameras and we have here one, the universal camera. Actually this camera controls the scheme by using the arrow keys. So if I push left, I'm going to the left side. If I push the right arrow key, I would go to the right side and yeah, forward and backward the same. So how does this look in the code? At first, again, we use a class for that because it's TypeScript. So the class is actually called universal camera, like the camera is called. And then you give it a name, and then you give it a position where it should stay in your scheme and add it to the scheme. OK, but still, we didn't define where we're going to look with the camera. And that's by then setting the target. And now we're going to set it by the zero vector, so it looks always in the center of our scheme. But we can control the scheme at the moment. That's done by camera attached to, con uh, attached to control. So we say, hey, this canvas, you should control by your arrow keys and set it to true, so it's always going to control it. But the, just one camera, that would be set. There are more cameras depending which use case you have. For example, there's the arcutation camera. The arcutation camera is actually a camera which always looking on the same point of your scheme, but rotating around the, sky, uh, around the point in the scheme. So how are we going to implement it again? 
we're using a class, we give it a name, we're going to say how much it should weigh it on this beta alpha part, which you're going to see on the picture, and then we're going to say how far away from the center the uh, camera should stand. And then we must add it to the screen again. And we do also do need to attach it to control. But we still don't see anything on the screen. Why? Without light, everything is still black on the screen. It's like, we, like in the real world. So what are we going to do? We're going to add a light. In this case, we're going to start with the simple light which we have, the point light. The point light is actually light which do have a point, like the name said, and it's emit the light completely from this point to all directions which we have. Yeah, that's what the point light does. So how does it look in code? Again, we have a class, we do have the name again, but we do define now at the options part where the point is, and we add it to the scheme. Then you have a light on your scheme. But how about a different light, something like a spotlight, which you have something like here on the pot rooftop? Um, for that, we could use the spotlight class, and it's actually a bit a little different. It also has a point where it's going to start, but it gives you a, a scatter radius where you can say, oh, it should be spread it like this, like a cone, for example. And then we need to give it a direction, in which direction light will show you, and also intensity it should be something like 10 meters or 2 meters, um, depending what you really want to do with the light. And in code, again, we use a class, we give it a name, we say where the point is, we're going to say in which direction the light should be emitted, how far um, the scatter radius should be, and how much the intensity is for this kind of light. And yay, we have light. Yeah, so we have a light and we have a camera, so we, so we can actually see something now, but our scene still is very, very empty, and that's where we begin to use meshes. A mesh is basically a bunch of triangles that create a shape, and I know that looks quite complicated, but the good news is we do not need to create those ourselves. Babylon.js already has a thing called Mesh Builder, which we are going to use, and the Mesh Builder offers uh, all basic shapes, and there's lots of online resources of very complex meshes that you can just use for everything you need. And uh, of course, once we have created our mesh in the world, we need to think about where we are going to position it. In Babylon.js, there's this thing called world axis. I think it looks similar to what we had in geometry class back in school. And uh, these world axes have an origin point that's defined by the vector 0, 0, 0. And when we create a mesh, and this time this tiny little mustache, it's created in the origin point, so 0, 0, 0. And if we want to move it around, we need to give it a vector. And uh, then the mustache will magically move to where the vector points. Of course, we can also rotate objects. And uh, for the rotation, it's important to know that each and every mesh also has their own local axis with the center point, that's the 0, 0, 0 vector of the local axis. And to rotate it, we again assigned a vector, this time a radiant vector, and uh, the mesh magically begins to rotate. This is quite easy to do. Uh, let's just create a simple box, just like before we have our class, create box. I uh, already talked about the mesh builder, then we give it a name, just simple box. We have a couple of options that define the size of the box, and this type, uh, in this case, we have a simple cube, and then, of course, we give the scene to the box. Next, we can uh, put the position. We can uh, address x, epsilon, and z both separately, but we can also just uh, give them a whole vector of uh, three data points, and uh, we have the box. We moved the position. We rotated the little box, but it still looks very, very boring, doesn't it? And in order to make it more interesting, we used this thing called materials. A material is basically like a perfect skin that wraps around your mesh without any sticky ends pointing up or whatever. And uh, when we think about materials, there are three important color types that we need to take care of. The first color is the diffuse color. The diffuse color is like the color of the object itself. Like my shirt would be black. And uh, then there's the specular color, that's like the highlight color. If a spotlight would light directly at that object, um, that's the color that would appear. Like, my bracelet is shiny, so the specular color would be a light silver. My pants are not shiny, so it wouldn't have a specular color. The last color is the emissive color. The emissive color is the color that, if the object were to shine itself like a light bulb, that would be the color that we see. 
but with materials you can also influence the texture of the, obje of the objects that we see, like we can make it appear like grass or wood or stone or whatever. And the good thing is Babylon.js also is uh, very supportive when it comes to materials. We can just say, hey, please give us a new standard material, which we call material. We set a diffuse color, we set a specular color, and then we just assign the material to our box and we are done. We have a colorful box. But now that we have the box, we also want to interact with it, right? We want to make it clickable, for example. And for this, Babylon.js has this nice thing called actions. And when it comes to actions, we need to think about two things. The first thing is the action type. The action type can be something like set a value, play a sound, or please execute this block of code. Um, Babylon.js has a set list of different action types that we can draw upon. The other thing that we need to think about is, of course, the trigger. That can be something like, hey, I clicked the box, or I double clicked the box, or I pressed this key. Again, Babylon.js has a whole list of things that we can just use. So in order to make our object clickable, we need to define an action manager on our object and then combine the action with the action manager. This sounds a lot more complicated than it actually is because in source code, all that we need to do is, like I said, we define the action manager on our box and then we register an action with our action manager. Uh, in this case, we are just having an execute code action and we set the unpick trigger. The unpick trigger means I click the box and something happens. And what I want to happen is, I want to have a log message that tells me, yes, I clicked on the box and I want to assign the material that we just defined. So if we go back into the browser and click in our box, this is what we see. Our box is no longer a boring gray, but it's like a happy minty green. And we, of course, have the lock message, hey, I clicked on the box. But we told you we don't want to build a box. We actually want to build a house, yeah. right? So let's do that. So before we could build a house, we must cover the basics, which we have already done now. So let's build a house. Uh, I would say a house normally has some kind of walls, so I'm going to use a box for that and say, yeah, I do have a cube house at the moment, so I'm created. I do not like gray houses, so I'm giving it a texture, for example, a yellow house texture. And I think my house needs at least something like a roof. So I'm going to use another mesh, which we haven't seen before, the Kate Polydron. Actually, it's created some kind of diamond, which you're going to set on the top of the house. But it's also gray. I do not like gray stuff. So I can give it a color, for example, red in this case. I'm going to change the position of the diamond because it's now still in the center of the box because each match you're going to create is always at the vector 0, 0, 0 normally. So you must change the position of it. And I rotate it a little bit so that it foot would fit on the house. So how does it look? It looks like this. So we have a house. Yay! You could have multiple houses. Yay! <laughs> but still, that's pretty boring. And I do like rubber ducks. So why not let it snow rubber ducks? How am I going to do that? I'm going to use a particle system. A particle system is actually based on 2D sprites. For example, here my rubber duck and the emitter from which my rubber duck is going to emit it in some kind of direction. Now it goes down. If I said just this single point, I want to have a little bit more spreading around the emitter. So I can define a box in which I said, OK, from here you're going to emit all my rubber ducks. You can even change the size of it, and now you get rubber ducks raining from the steam. But how does it look in code? You're going to use a particle system and say, hey, how much particle I want to use? In this case, I want to have 2,000 rubber ducks. But I think there are still two less rubber ducks. You could use more. And then I must tell them that it should actually use my rubber duck texture by saying that's my particle texture. I must say where the emitter is located. and I want to have it covered my complete scheme, so I'm going to sit the emitter box a little bit farther than it actually is. So it's now covering my complete screen. And actually, I do want to have the rubber ducks falling down like rain. So I'm giving them a gravity vector, and all rubber ducks are pulled in this kind of direction. You're going to see that there's a negative uh, Y value, so it goes down. If I would put a positive inside of this, it would go up. And I must set how much uh, rubber duck should be emitted at one time, so in my case, 900, 999, but still also to less. And yeah, we won't see anything at the moment if we would execute that. Why? Because we must start the particle system. And that's something we're going to do then. If you want to stop it, you can also call it by particle system stop. 
Okay, so now we have a house and we have rubber ducks raining from the sky, but in the beginning I said Babylon.js is a game engine, so what else can it do? Well, in a game we probably want to have something like animation, and uh, yes, Babylon.js can do that. Uh, it also has a whole list of special effects that you can uh, use. For example, you just need a few lines of code and then you have a ground that's like boiling lava, or you can create fog. But the feature that I have come to value a lot is the debug layer. You can watch that every step of your scene, you have all sorts of parameters that you can look at, that you can uh, play around with in order to figure out what's going wrong or where to improve. And uh, before we go to the demo, we of course want to talk about why should you use it. And uh, for me, it was very, very easy to get started with Babylon.js. Babylon.js has a lot of online resources. The documentation is almost always up to date. They have a nice playground where on one side you have your source code and on the other side you directly see what's happening and you can just play around with it. And uh, of course, it runs in a browser. So when I create something, Nobody needs to install anything. They just type in a URL, they hit enter, and they see what I have built. And uh, the great thing is it's very, very extensive. There's a lot of function, a lot of features, and we've only just talked about very few of them. But of course, when something is that extensive, it can be quite daunting to get started with it. And uh, sometimes it's just too much functionality for what I want to do. And of course, since it's running in the browser, there are just some limits with, that we cannot surpass. And so in some cases, Babylon.js just isn't the right thing for what you want to do. But in our experience, it's a very, very great thing. And uh, there's definitely a learning curve, at least for us when we started using it for our project. Uh, we had quite some trouble with performance, but the more we did it, we did with it, the more we learned about it, the more we understood it the easier it was for us to improve on the performance as well. And uh, the, the community and the resources are just great and very, very helpful. So now let's actually get to our demo. So all the source code is also on Git. We will post the link uh, later on, and that's the wrong field. I need to be down there in order to actually start it up. And I typed an R too much. So there we are, and if we go into the browser, we have our small little world. <laughs> With Rubber ducks. Still does. And uh, remember the little cube we talked about that was interactable? This should be that one. There, we have it. So, with Babylon.js, we told you we can do a lot more. For example, we could put, put in a height map. Yeah, if you start toying with something like this, normally the playground isn't small anymore because you said, oh, I want to have this feature, I want to have this feature, and we want to have a ground because Oh, houses don't fly in the air, so we put a ground on it. And actually, we do have something more. Yeah, we also built uh, in some gravity. Oh, yeah. We can show you the source code as well. Just put it in there. Yeah. And I'm going to resize it a little bit so we have the source code on the other side. And there we see a ball falling down, which uh, is thanks to the gravity. So. Uh, in the beginning, we talked about the init game method that we can see here. We have our canvas, our engine, and our theme. We define the light and the arc rotation camera. The arc rotation camera was this satellite-like thing that is always directed to one point in the scene. So, like you see, we can actually watch it from all sides, but it's always directly looking at the center of our scene. And um, this is the create hate map. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, actually, we still have time, something like 10 minutes, so we can do that. I hope you can all read it, or we could make it a little bit yeah, bigger. Yeah, we should probably make it a little bit bigger. I'm sorry, didn't think of that before. I do not, not know working. how to read it on your laptop. How do we make it bigger? Actually, it's just a different kind of mesh which we are using. It's a plane, so it's just like a paper. And what you're going to see there is we're going to make a plane based on a height map, which we 
found somewhere on the internet by Wikipedia, and put it on top of it, and also put uh, some kind of texture on the top of it, so it looks a little bit different there. on some spots. And yeah, it's great. It's that's big. better. But that's physics. That's another story. The head map. Yeah, actually, it looks pretty easy and is. You just import the height map from the path, which we have by us in our like, local setup. We're going to set how wide and height of this plane and say how much subdivided it. So when we're not going to subdivide it, we just get a flat plane, but we don't uh, really want to have the small mountains on top of it. So we're going to subdivide it in more sub-meshes, actually. Yeah, and we're going to set the height. If we would increase the height, may I? Please. It would look like this, so more like a really strange mountain from Lord of the Rings, I would say. But we could make it again back to normal. Um, that's actually how a height map is working. And we do have this little ball which is still jumping around. That's based on gravity. And where's the gravity part? I think it was above. Ah, there. So you must enable gravity on uh, Babylon.js. There are different kinds of library under the hood, so Babylon.js is actually not implementing it. It's using other libraries which are pretty great, like Omnio or Ikiat and this kind of stuff. And yeah, we need some stuff to interact, so we're going to create a sphere. And the sphere normally doesn't know that it um, contains some gravity stuff. So we're going to put an imposter object onto the sphere and saying you are now some kind of physics object. And this imposter object actually holds all physics data which you need. And yeah, again, we use the fair, so we're going to use the physics imposter for that. We're going to say the mass of this stuff. So for example, this is two kilograms. And we just say with the restoration how much jumpy this stuff is. So this is really jumpy, but our bottom plane isn't jumpy, but we can make it jumpy. And now we should see a ball. Oops. There it is. Which is jumping really high back and low and back and low and again and again until it stops. Probably in this example it will never stop. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually how gravity is working. You need at least two objects so that you can um, collide them and see the effects of gravity. Without it would be really boring to so just see a ball falling down. Um, the jumping effect is a little bit better than this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we also mentioned we could make the ducks fly upwards. Oh, yeah. We can uh, have a look at that. The um, duck particle system. I'm not sure if you can see that. Oh, yeah, that goes yes. a little bit up. So Floating now they are flying ducks. away. <coughs> and to be honest, for me, it's still to less rubber ducks. Let's make more of our ducks. Oh, yeah, that sometimes happens. You can go under the scheme, like always. But you can also restrict it. That's one of the great things about Babylon.js. In the beginning, it just sets a lot of default values for you. But once you get to know it more, you can uh, set a lot of variables for yourself and then, for example, restrict the camera so that it wouldn't be able to actually go beneath the scene or can't go above the scene for whatever reason you might want to do that. And uh, yeah. So I would recommend giving Babylon.js a try. And when you do so, please have fun with it and go get crazy with it. If you want to have thousands of rubber ducks flying up or down or wherever, just do it. And um, that's about it. We will be around for the conference. If you have uh, any questions or if you want to see more stuff that we did, uh, please just uh, seek us out or ping us up on Twitter. And uh, we will post the slides and all the code later on.